Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Episode 21 of the Mark Martin Podcast, and the year is going to be 1979. Before we get to it, make sure to hit up markmartinpod.com to listen to all the episodes at Mark Martin Pod on all of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And also, make sure to hit us up on all of the different podcast players. Make sure to give us that five-star rating, subscribe, and catch all of these awesome podcasts chronicling Mark Martin's career. But episode 21, we're going to head into 1979. But Mark, you have a story about 1977 that you wanted to flip back to before we get started on 1979. Yeah, well, I'll start out with uh, with Holler uh, stuff anyway for 79. So um, that's a big story um, each of these years. And I have forgotten one of our crazy episodes uh you know if you uh, remember back to 77 you know that's when we finally got the uh you know the evolution from the uh the chevy pickup to the uh, d- uh double cab four door to the dually ramp truck and then uh uh the first three years and then our fourth year in 77 um that's when we had uh my dad added the the double stick transmission duplex and uh you know we we didn't have enough brakes now we've got all this horsepower this massive uh engine 454 all tricked out and everything and got the gears so we got lots of speed but we can't stop and so somehow or another um Troy Lynn Jeffries uh, figured out how to get the brake boosters added to this thing so we could also get it slowed down or my dad I wasn't I never drove it my dad always drove Uh, and you know it seemed like uh, and and then we built that little trailer probably uh, 8 by 10 or 8 by 8 trailer that we pulled behind it little little U-Haul like trailer that had the spare we had a spare mo had to carry a spare engine, uh, toolbox and uh, uh, parts and pieces and a 55 gallon drum of fuel and all those kinds of things because we were starting to do longer races and we had to have we had to have all that stuff. So we we built this little trailer to tow behind the the hauler and uh, filled it up with race engines and toolbox and all this stuff. And, uh, it seemed like every time we left to go, we raced Friday night a lot. We raced Friday night at Springfield, Missouri, 200 mile trip. And, uh, then, then spend the night and go to Fort Smith on Saturday night, race Saturday night at Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, tri-state speedway, um, both were asphalt. So we, uh, seemed like. This was early in the season uh, and, and leading up to the middle of the season. And every time we left, the, the, the race shop was uh, right next to the trucking company. And every time we left, my dad was late. Uh, he was late because, you know, he was dispatching and working in the office and everything. And he was always mad. And I mean always mad. He had a terrible temper. Uh, and was a scary dude when he was pissed and he was, he was always late. We were all sitting in the truck waiting on him and he'd get out there to the truck finally. And we would leave and we would go to Springfield in three hours. It's two lane road almost all the way. And we'd go 200 miles. We'd make it in three hours sharp. Um, it was, uh, it was insane. Uh, the way he drove past, he believed in passing cars when you caught them, no matter what, where hills, curves, whatever. It was uh, it was really, uh, for most people that rode with us, it was fairly frightening, but um, that's what we did. So um, we were, there was a big two-day show in, in Fort Smith. Um, it was an ASA race, actually, 
I think. And uh, so we left late for that on Friday. It was a Friday, Saturday night show. We left late on Friday and uh, didn't get 30 miles from from home. And we caught a Volkswagen going about 50 miles an hour uh, around a curve. And Dad never even checked up, just whipped out to pass him. And when he whipped out to pass him, uh, here comes a dump truck head on. So he whipped back in and obviously couldn't, uh, wasn't going to be able to not hit the Volkswagen. So he ditched it and we went through the ditch and it was a hell of a rough ride through that ditch and gully, uh, and everything. We got stopped and, uh, scared us pretty good and we got stopped and, and, uh, Shaw said, Larry Shaw said, and we had this guy, Claude Reed, that, that, uh, used to help us too. He was, uh, was a trucker that worked for my dad and, uh, Claude, he seemed like he would, if you said, boy, it sure is sunny today. He'd say, no, it's dark. He seemed like he was always arguing. So we come to a stop in this ditch, all happy to be alive. And Shaw says, boy, I bet that trailer went for a ride back there. And, uh, Claude Reed said, no, it ain't back there. We got out of the truck and that trailer had broke off at the tongue, stuck in the ground and went end over end over end. And out there in the woods, there was a racing engine, a barrel of busted fuel, a nine sixteenths wrench here, screwdriver there. The tools were scattered everywhere. Spare parts, you know, it was just a, a disaster. And I was man, I was pissed, you know, it was messing my racing program up for all this ridiculous stuff. So anyway, um, we got the, the hauler itself back out on the road. And so the rest of us left and went on to Fort Smith to get ready to practice and qualify. And my dad had somebody come and pick him up and he loaded up all the parts and pieces out of the woods and everything, got everything loaded up in some other truck and met us up there, uh, the next day with everything. So that was, uh, that was the kind of road trips that we took in 77. They were, uh, they would, uh, they would scare most people. How did, how did you, I mean, it, with a, with an accident like that, how did you guys recover? Go and pick up the pieces and, and, and how did you recover from that? Well, my dad picked up the pieces. He stayed back and picked up the pieces and gathered everything up and came came the next day. Um, but we just went on. We went on and qualified uh, for the race. Uh, we didn't need the spare parts and stuff. We had enough stuff to get us through qualifying on the rig, and we got through qualifying. And, and it was a 200-lapper. Um, dad got there the next day with all the stuff and the fuel and everything, gas cans and everything. And... Uh, I believe we won that race. Uh, certainly believe we won that race at 200 lapper. It was, uh, it was a big deal. It was a big race and a big deal for us, but that was the kind of trips we, we made. So fast forward, of course, I have the next year following 77. I have, you know, the podcast for 78. And now we're going to talk about 1979. Well, in 78, I had that one year I had that Ford cube cube van and that real heavy trailer we blew three motors up in that cube Ford cube van. So wasn't going to do that anymore. So, um, uh, Rusty had a, a step van, you know, bread truck. They called the Hilton cause it had a bunk in it and a sofa behind the driver's seat. And it worked out really, really good. We pulled a trailer and then had all the spare parts in the back side of the step van. So I ordered a, a, a new step van with a 454 in it uh, for the 79 season and, uh, was pretty excited about tricking that out, put a sleeper sofa right behind the driver's seats and then built a bunk up above the, the, uh, the sofa and, uh, and was getting that truck already. And of course we got, uh, we went and got us another new how chassis, uh, to build a new how car. But in 78, as you recall, I went down to New Smyrna and raced for the championship and won the, won the speed weeks, won the, uh, world series of asphalt racing. 
and it didn't pay any money. It co- you know, it cost us a lot of money to go do that. And, you know, I was racing on basically pretty much winnings. Um, you know, we got a lot of free stuff. We won the championship in 78. So, you know, we were on a tire deal. Uh, we had a reasonable engine deal, although it cost money. We got just about all the parts. Everything that we used on the car was free. So we, we, I kind of operated the, the operation off the winnings and my dad, you know, bought, uh, some of the trick parts and, you know, like the hauler and a few of the things like that. So I wasn't going to waste the money to do new Smyrna in 79. So my plan was to go down there and go to the oval track trade show, which was at Daytona during speed weeks back then. Now it's kind of the PRI show in Indy, but I was going to go to the trade show, uh, and, you know, hustle up more deals, more free stuff. And while I was down there, uh, Duke Southern had the Southern school of, uh, auto racing, which was a driving school that I had actually attended in uh, the spring of 76 when I was moving up to late models from the six cylinder division. And so I knew Duke and Duke, uh, now I've, you know, gone on and won the ASA national championship at 19 years old and was really getting a lot of publicity and people were making a big deal out of it. So Duke hired me to be one of the driving instructors. So I went from a below average driver, uh, what I thought, you know, when I went and, and, uh, took his school, I certainly didn't show any potential there. For some reason, I wasn't able to shine to uh, being an instructor and over the course of three years. So that was my speed week plan was to go down there, do a little driving instruction, go to speed weeks um, and go to the trade show. And Billy Harvey was having a big birthday bash down at uh, Fort Lauderdale and about what I knew about Billy Harvey was he was always fun to talk to. He was always having fun. All his race cars and his trucks and everything were powder blue, real pretty powder blue. And everything he, everything that you could possibly chrome was chromed. The jack stands were chromed. The jacks were chromed. The wheels were chromed, chrome everywhere. And, uh, he was having a birthday party. So I was like, I was like, man, I got to go down there and check this out. So I went down, I saw his place of business, which was, uh, uh, his racing thing was fast lane racing, but he's, uh, towing service. He had a massive towing service where they towed cars, wrecker service and all. And I'm forgetting right now what that was, what that was called. But anyway, I went down and saw his, his, uh, towing service and went to, went to Spartan. Now, Mind you, I'm 20 years old and I'm traveling around in my 1978 Dodge van that's, uh, tricked out, really tricked out. It's the Dodge van with the 440 Magnum all tuned up headers and four barrel and all that. So I got fender flares. I got big wheels and tires. I got the inside tricked out where one of the sofas in it made down into a bed. So I was pretty well set. So I drove it from. Uh, Arkansas to Daytona and then I got ready to go from Daytona to Fort Lauderdale and I'm just a dumb ass 20 year old kid I ain't got no idea how far it is dude it's five or six hour drive down there so I got down there hung out checked everybody out you know socialized a while got ready to leave to come back home about midnight and uh so I head out that five hour trip and for some reason I ain't got enough gas. I get, you know, somewhere south of Daytona it's around 5 AM and I am on fumes. I finally see an exit and I see a gas station sign. So I hit that exit. When I hit that exit, I run out. So now I'm coasting and, uh, I managed to coast it right on in there and right up to the fuel pumps. Only one problem. They ain't open yet. So I just got in the back and took a nap. About 7 a.m. they opened up. I fueled her up, drove her on back to the hotel in Daytona. 
and uh, took me a shower and went out to New Smyrna and did some driving instructions. So um, when you're uh, when you're young and you're dumb, you got to be tough. So that's what that's what I was, I guess. I learned to get really tough because I was really dumb. The big story of 79 in my eyes, one of the two biggest stories is my uh, Oval Track trade show. I'm in there working deals and I see these white Cobra coil springs. I walk over to the booth and it's Ray Dillon. And yeah, he says, yeah, man, I, I, I'll give you springs. You run the decal. I'll give you all the springs you you want all the springs you need. I said, okay. He said, I'll also give you a trailer too, if you want a trailer. And I said, okay, yeah, man, I, I need a trailer. I'm going to have to have a trailer and I hadn't made plans yet for a trailer. So I'll take you up on that deal. And he says, I've also got a shop. If you want to use it, I'll give that to you for free too. And I was like, okay. Dang, that sounds good. I can get out of Arkansas, get up in North Liberty, Indiana, closer to where I'm racing. I'm chasing that ASA championship every year, so that'll be centrally located. And I'll get, you know, a chance to get out, uh, you know, out of Batesville um, and sort of independent of my, my dad, who, you know, was probably running pretty wild and crazy at this period of time. I wasn't necessarily approving of uh, the way he was conducting his life and, uh, who he was marrying and, and those kind of things at the, t- at the time or who he, what, you know, who he's marrying, who he's divorced or whatever. He was, uh, running pretty wild. So I decided, uh, yeah, that's a good deal. And he says, and I also have a house that I'll rent you for 150 a month. Oh, that's perfect. Right next to the shop. That's perfect. So I went home from Daytona started loading up all my stuff and uh and I headed to North Liberty, Indiana in March and uh when I arrived there uh, I found a a pole barn with no insulation at all tin roof and this is what he was calling a shop it was enough room there wasn't enough room to put a, two race cars in it There was enough room to put one race car in it and then, you know, kind of sprawl out with your tools and stuff. Okay, that's good enough. The house we rented, well, it was nothing special, but it was okay. Um, And um, how about that trailer? He pointed to the steel rack. He says, there it is in the steel rack. It's all yours. Build it. So, uh, banjo had been, you know, with me, uh, living with me ever since, uh, uh, 77, that, uh, race at Cincinnati in the fall of 77. So he'd been with me all through 78. And so banjo and I tackled building a trailer cause we had to have a trailer. So we built a trailer, really nice trailer, by the way. And, uh, all we had in it was our labor and, uh, we finished up our race car, how chassis put Dylan enterprise sticker on it. Cause you know, Dylan was doing all those things for me. Um, let's see if there were any other odds and ends about the situation. I had one other full-time employee. So I had banjo and one other, uh, David Lovendahl, um, my ex brother-in-law. Um, I had hit him up to come to work for me as well. So he moved up there. So the three of us moved into this, uh, three bedroom house and, uh, got ourselves set up and started getting ready to go racing for the season. And, uh, it was, uh, it was an exciting time. Um, the racing was, you know, we built a little bit nicer car than we had in 78. It was lighter. It was better. Um, I was getting better. I was learning a lot. Ray Dillon gave me a key to his shop. I could go in his shop at any time I wanted, use any of his equipment, uh, tools or equipment or anything that he wanted. I'm sitting there 
20 years old, you know, just, I don't know how a guy would have so much, you know, faith in me, but to give, give me the key to his shop, but he did. And, uh, so anyway, by the time we got the race car loaded up on the trailer and hooked to the, uh, the step van, uh, I noticed that that made the, it rate the front end of the step van raised up. So I rolled out the cutting torch out there and heated up the front springs so that the front springs would collapse down some. And I got her sitting level and now my truck was right, brother. Uh, that baby was, was, was right. I had the headers, the Holly four barrel, um, and everything had her sitting right, stance, right. New how car on the trailer. Everything's going my way. I got two employees. They each make a hundred dollars a week cash. And, uh, I set out to make it all work. Um, financially, you know, we raced for good purses. We didn't pay for, uh, hardly anything. And we were able to, to, uh, have everything that we needed to race with and, and make, uh, make the dollars and cents work. Um, you know, we win, you know, quite a few races. Um, things went well. We successfully defended our, our ASA championship. Um, and so we won back to back won won our second championship in a row, um, 78, then 79 toward the fall, uh, Ray, you know, Ray had built some race cars, but they were crude, rough. They did not meet my standards. I was, uh, I was becoming a, a really good fabricator. My cars were really nice. I liked everything that I had really clean, neat, and nice. Banjo was incredible about that. He was a very, very good organizer and as well. So he and I just, we just worked the competition completely in the ground. There was no way that you were going to beat us on work. Uh, you might outsmart us, maybe. Um, but you would not outwork us, no chance of it. And even though it was just he and I and, and DL, uh, Love and Doll, we, man, we worked hard. We got it done. So anyway, Ray's been building these race cars. He's had in the back of his mind the whole time, probably that I'm going to get Mark, you know, to help me build a world beater race car. So he comes to me and he says, Hey, I, I got this old race car that so-and-so races, I'd like for you to drive it. Okay, I'll go to, we go to Hartford, uh, Michigan for a race, and I drive that car, and um, it's a coilover car with a stock Camaro front snout, which is everything everybody used back then. And on the way home, we're drinking, and race starts in on me. We want to build, design a race car, build a race car, design a race car. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing you got to do is get a damn jig because we ain't building a bunch of cobbled up mess. So, uh, Ray goes and gets him a surface plate and starts getting it ready, uh, to build a jig. And we take the, the known, uh, we take the known rear suspension a rear three link rear suspension that we know works really well. Uh, and we organize that for rear suspension. We build a tubular front snout, uh, and use the Camaro pivot points, uh, basically for lower control arms, but we build tubing, tubular, lower control arms, coilover shocks. And, uh, and we, and we use a uh, sort of known upper A-frame, a known spindle that, you know, had been working on cars, uh, rack and pinion we got with Randy Sweet and uh, got racks for them. So we built rack and pinion. And uh, while we were doing that, uh, we, you know, Ray said, Hey, there's not any reason why we shouldn't make this right frame rail straight instead of kicking out to the right. It'd be a straight rail car. And the roll cage would be 
you know, it wouldn't go all the way to the right side. You know, it, it would it would go about three fourths over. So, it was a radically designed compared to what everybody was running, with exception of Bimco and Frings. They both built uh, tubular front snout cars and coilovers and rack and pinion, but they were not winning all the races. Of course, trickle won everything, but everybody counted that as being trickle and didn't give the car as much credit as it, it was probably due. So we built and designed this and, and Ray said, I'm going to call it the Mark II chassis because, you know, um, uh, I pretty much had a huge hand in, you know, how the design was, what the suspension was like. And he was more on the construction side of the, the chassis part of it. So, uh, you know, our deal was, is, you know, I build you two cars, um, and it's the same deal as a trailer. Once a car is built, I supply you with all the parts except motor and transmission. And, um, and you, you put the car together, you and your boys put the car together like you want it put together, hang the body and all that stuff. And all you have to supply is the engine transmission. When you're done with it, you take the engine transmission back and I get my car back. So that was kind of our long range looking deal where we really wrote a page in the history book. Uh, late 79, we were designing and building this car for 1980 and the 1980, um, uh, podcast will really get into depth about what we did, what we accomplished and the amazing things we did. But 1979 was a very, uh, important year for me because it, I, I became independent. Um, I was able to get out, out of Arkansas, uh, out of my dad's shop, uh, be able to financially, uh, run a business, um, and make it work and also make the contact, the very important contact with Ray Dillon, uh, while honing my, you know, fabrication skills, um, I had already pretty much was all over the tire program with Firestone tires um, and, and managing all that stuff. And then, um, just making all the contacts with, with, with people, uh, getting, you know, a better drive, becoming a better driver. All these things were all fixing to culminate for an absolutely, uh, earth shattering 1980. Um, and so I really look forward and I'm excited about, uh, going into that, uh, you know, going into, into that podcast for 1980, but we spent a lot of time going up and down the road, uh, me and the boys up and down the road in that step van with the doors open, uh, slid open on each side. We went through Chicago about nearly every weekend. We'd go up to Wisconsin and race or somewhere and, uh, driving, through Chicago on that Dan Ryan expressway and in that truck with the doors open, just some, some kids seeing the, the world from the windshield of a, of a step van. It was, uh, an incredible time for, for all of us. Um, and I know, especially for Banjo and I, because we were, we were so young, David Lovendahl was, you know, quite a bit older than I was. And he was, uh, he was really an adult. We were, just two kids uh, trying to live and and compete in a man's world. So that was uh, that was an amazing time. So what do you think? Uh, what drew Ray Dillon to you? Was it? I mean, he was a former racer, but what drew him to wanting to help you? Now it, it sounds like he he you know he understood uh, the complexity of coming from Batesville and and running pavement races up north, but. I mean, what really tied him to you? Because that's a huge break for you. That was big. Well, I won the championship, the ASA championship in 78. And I can't, I can't tell you enough what a big story that was at, at 19 years old, being the ASA na- national champion, 
I got amazing uh, coverage and, you know, was in uh, Speed Sport News every week and Stock Car Magazine every month and, um, you know, just had a lot of recognition. And Ray knew that for what little bit of bone he threw me, that that would be a big feather in his cap for me to be racing, you know, out of, out of his shop. Uh, not as, not as car building shop, but he's pole barn out next door. <laughs> uh, but I also think he probably Ray Dillon was a brilliant guy, super smart. And I think he always had in the back of, I believe he had in the back of his mind that he wanted to build a car with me. Um, you know, and, and, uh, get his program on the map because he, you know, he was more of a, uh, at that point he was more, he built really good coil springs and he built some, uh, decent trailers, but they were just decent. They weren't anything special. And he was more of a farmer turning racer than anything. And I just think that he was looking to put his business on the map. He was a smart guy and, uh, latching onto me would be a feather in his cap. We'd get him some recognition as well. And after I was there for, you know, a race season, he's like, okay, it's time for us to design and build a car. We can build a better race car than you're racing. And, and I told him, well, here's, here's the conditions. I'll do that, but here's the conditions. I have to be in control of the part suspension part of it, you know, the handling part of it. And he was in control of the construction side of it. And it really worked out well because that way I knew what I was getting for suspension was going to be something that I could fairly relate with, uh, fairly relate to and construction wise was going to be way lighter and stronger than anything that I'd had before, which was, uh, pro, you know, progression and the coilover shocks was just a, a major, uh, step in the right direction and rack and pinion steering as well. The thing that I really had to get, the steering wasn't that big a deal, but the biggest thing in this whole changeover for this car we designed was figuring out spring rates. Um, you know, that was, that was my biggest challenge. That was the only nuance that I had was I was going to have to figure out spring rates. And so we'll get into that in uh, in the 1980 podcast. So to give uh, fans kind of a, a outlook on the, the 1980 podcast, that's that's when the chassis was coming into play, and then it, then it went boom in 1980. Yeah, we started building it in the fall of 79. Started, you know, got a surface plate, started, you know, uh, mounting the surface plate, and started making some fixtures and whatnot. Um, you know, Ray, they could bend their own roll cage cages already. So they were able to, to, uh, they were already equipped to, to do the road cages. So it was all just getting ready to start manufacturing those chassis. So we're going to get to 1980 in the next episode, Mark, a couple questions before we leave. Uh, this is more so just because, because uh, of interest, but why was your cars, why were they orange and red at that time? Uh, they started out, I liked, there was a, there was a Camaro that raced before I was racing at, uh, around Arkansas. It was number 222 and it was orange. And I liked that car. I liked the number 222 and I liked the orange car. So my first car was number two and it was orange. And then the second car, I decided to add some white to it. And that really brought it to life. And so that was my colors. Those orange and white race cars were what I had all the way until until sponsors dictated something different. So then you went with the uh, the blue number. And uh, and then uh, one thing that's like a, a almost like a trademark of your cars back in the day was to have that that Thunderbird or that Trans Am look to it on the hood. Yeah, I like the fire chicken on the hood. I like the look of that. So I did that. I also loved, uh, um, you know, some of the uh, sign painting 
that were I mean, back then you lettered all the cars, you know, painted all the lettering and uh Finley signs up in Michigan did some really cool lettering up there. And so we took the took the step van up there for him to letter up uh because it was brand new and he was getting ready to do some painting we all went to dairy queen for lunch and we come back walk in the shop and he's got his cup with his coke in it and it has you know back then dennis the menace was look you know that character was the dairy queen character and he looked at that and he said i got an idea and he went to painting and that's when he painted that uh Dennis the Menace, because my nickname was the kid. So he painted Dennis the Menace with the straw in his mouth and his helmet and uniform on. Look, you know, of me walking. It's a very, very cool. Um, it was a really cool idea. And then, uh, of course, Finley did also did uh, the uh, the lettering on the race car. I had two cars in 80, one car in 79, but two cars in 80. And um, I did one in yellow, yellow ish numbers with the convex look. And then I did one with the blue numbers, um, and the blue numbers were, that was, that was man, that was money. That, that was it. So I stuck with that, um, that blue numbers through 80 and 81. And then after 81 sponsors dictated, so numbers started to change and colors started to change and got away from that identity at, at that point. Tell us about that household in uh, Indiana. I mean, it's you and your two guys. You're just busting your ass working, outworking everyone, as you said. I mean, what kind of what kind of atmosphere was it around that house? And it sounds like you guys were just hammering away working all the time. But I mean, were you getting wild? Were you having fun? What were you doing? I was I was in the early stages of you know, drinking, um, like, first of all, you know, I won the championship in 1978. I was just 19 years old. And after the races, all my heroes went to the bar and I couldn't get in. So, you know, I was kind of left out. Everybody, everybody else has grown up but me. So eventually I did get a, uh, a fake ID and, um, and so I could go in the bars where my heroes were and hang out with them, but I couldn't drink much. I would stand around to be like them. They'd hand me a beer and I'd stand and hold that beer, sip a little bit off of it until it'd get hot. And then I'd have to throw it out and get me another cold one and sip off. I never could finish a beer like in 70 and 78, um, or really even couldn't hardly drink much in 79, but I was working on becoming an expert at it. And we'll get to that in the, the later, uh, the later podcast. But at this time I'm really, really tame, no nonsense, no, uh, no playing games. You know, it was all business. Banjo and I were both that way. Um, Banjo didn't drink, um, anything to speak of either. So, um, Love and Dog was a little different. He'd drink. Well, he's just grown up, you know. I mean, we didn't, uh, we worked with him day and night, but, you know, as far as personal time, he would, he was more of the adult, you know, thing and would, could drink more and whatever. We were not, at this point in time, we're not getting wild yet. Uh, but that is to come as we, as, as I grow and mature. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say mature as I grow and think I'm getting to be a big shot. Um, you know, I become more of an expert when it comes to being wild and, and being crazy. But at this point in time, no, I was, we were serious business and wasn't no, wasn't no games. Um, I ha- was becoming the guy that love and all nicknamed, uh, the little hemorrhoid. <laughs> Uh, at this time, because I was, I was extremely demanding, like you had to do your, your shit to the max. Perfect. You had to work all the time. 
because I did. And my, my expectations were really high of, of people around me because they were really high of myself. And so the little hemorrhoid eventually uh, evolved to a uh, prick of misery, uh, which he gave me that nickname as well. But that was a little later on. Um, 79, I'm probably just the little hemorrhoid. So, I mean, even to this day, you even in, in I guess you would call it quasi-retirement, you still have that work ethic. Well, I have to. That's who I am. I have to. Um, I'm at the shop right now and uh, anxious to, to finish this podcast so I can get back out there and, and uh, tr- tinker on my motor coach. I, I have to, there, you know it's just in my DNA. I, I, I can't not, I kind of have replaced race cars, uh, with my motor home. Uh, it's something that I can work on and I like projects where I can, uh, work on it and make it better. Same thing as I did my race cars, make it lighter, make a part better, make something prettier, make something work better or fix something that's broke. But always looking for something to improve on on it mechanically, or, or 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 whatnot, organize it or whatever. It's very much like I did my race cars. I'd be lost if I couldn't go hard. You know, of course, I was in the gym at six, uh, about six fifteen this morning, and that's all part of my part of my DNA. That's what I do. I'm in the gym every day at least six days a week um and and i've got to dig that's just that's who i am so we're gonna let you get back to the motorhome and then we're gonna talk about the year 1980 coming up in the very next podcast again race fans hit up at mark martin pod on all social media facebook instagram and twitter also make sure to go into your podcast player of choice make sure to hit subscribe give us that five star rating This is episode number 21 of the Mark Martin Podcast, coming up the year 1980. Thank you for subscribing and listening to the Mark Martin Podcast. Remember to give us a five-star rating in your app store. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mark Martin POD. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network.